So I was um, just wanted to ask you because you've had like a really busy past year and a half you know you had like kind of the reunion shows with the unicorns um you created the music for the soundtrack for serial um you just released a short film that premiered at tiff and then of course this solo album so i was just wondering how did city of courts kind of come to be and what was the process for it city of courts was uh born out of my disappointment with the uh, unicorns reunion um I was looking for that to be more, I think, more fulfilling, more satisfying, um, more enriching. And when it wasn't any of those things, um, I put that energy that I'd sort of been harnessing and, and building um, into the solo record. It, it was, <clears throat> you know, some songs I thought might be potential unicorn songs or some songs I just thought were in, in a style that was um, representative of, of the kind of thing I used to access back back in the OG days. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess this kind of just tails off of that, but what? so like, what were some of the themes you kind of have explored on this album or some of your inspiration for it? I guess you kind of, you know, just talked about that a little bit, but if you wanted to talk about some of the themes and inspirations yeah i usually i usually work in a pretty insular way i'm not i'm not explicitly getting inspiration from somewhere specific but it was basically like the tools that i had at hand were i was working in my apartment i was in my kitchen and i made the record in my kitchen oh very cool um and i had some you know i had some tools some instruments and programs some software and uh, I just sort of worked with what I had, and I, I wanted to make songs like that with drum machine and synth. And, um, yeah, I think Love is, Strang <clears throat> Love is Stranger was one of the first, and the Sting, <clears throat> the Sting was another early one. And I think those songs are the most representative of, of the thing that I was trying to do, um, which is kind of make these dark pop, songs with like a synth and drum machine kind of uh you know yeah absolutely I think, I think it was absolutely successful at that then and i guess just following up because i you know i never heard that that you made it in your kitchen so was it truly a solo album you doing absolutely everything or did you have some people working with you yeah 90 percent of it was me just working alone late into the night um in my in my kitchen um which sounds really sad, or making a record in your kitchen. So or brilliant, that's... either or. Once. <laughs> um, but I had a few friends and confidants uh, play on, on the songs. I had my friend Joe Plummer, who we have a band together called Mr. Heavenly. He played drums on I'm Nobody, which is an instrumental track. And I had uh, Jordy from Ireland, Jordy Gordon, play... Mm -hmm. um, guitar on Bohemian Groove and then my friend Chris Taylor who records under Anze, the name Anze played um, lead guitar on The Sting which gives it that kind of Pink Floyd feel I think yeah that's but one of my favorites. So, oh thanks yeah absolutely so I mean you just talked a little bit about the instrumentation so I just want to talk about the soundscape a bit because I mean Definitely correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to impose meaning where there is none. But um, some of the songs definitely have that like unicorns, unicorns vibes with some jangly kind of synth riffs. And then some are kind of more funk inspired grooves and some are slower ballads. Mm. So I was just wondering mm. if it's important to you to kind of keep a diverse soundscape on albums instead of a consistent one. And, you know, how you go about figuring out what you want an album to sound like. I don't think I calculate it that much. And I don't think I have any choice but to make things uh, sound the way they do because you know as someone I think as someone who listens to music a lot and thinks about music a lot um, I'm not I'm not that narrow minded that I would make a, a record uh, with just one genre of music I don't even make genre specific music I no, think it's yeah. often hard to pigeonhole the kind of thing that I'm doing and I think that's the result of just having a wide variety of influences that span many genres and, and styles and I think that's just sort of reflective of, of my approach to listening to music and then you know almost on a subconscious level like filtering that out 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's just more interesting right off the bat if you keep the listeners on their toes. Um, yeah. So I guess kind of some of my favorite um, songs on City of Courts is like The Sting and um, Witch Window. And so I was kind of wondering what your favorite song is on the album, whether it's your favorite to play live or it's just a song that's kind of more personal to you. I think The Sting is a fun one to play live. And I just like the groove. I feel like I feel proud of that one because it doesn't feel like it's trying to do too much. It's very simple um, and very calm in its in its execution. It's, it's very yeah. It's not trying to overstate things. I also do like which window. I was I think I was sort of trying to go for like a in my own way uh, kind of a spaceman three sort of jam or like a Jesus and Mary Chain thing with these big 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 guitar chords, you know, these shimmering chords. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there was a little bit of that um, intention. Um, that one, and, and then Love is Stranger, which was one of the first ones I worked on, where I was like, okay, I'm doing this, I'm making an album. And that one was super simple. For the most part, the song is, you know, at least off the top, it's just drum machine and, and synth bass. So there's really just trying to strip things away to, uh, to their fairest essence and seeing if they still, you know, kind of work. Yeah, absolutely. And is it often as simple as that? Like, hey, I guess I'm going to make an album now. I think so. Well, I was definitely spurred on by the disappointment in the reunion, which I found, like I said, just it didn't it did not go how I hoped it would. And I think doing this was just, I just had this energy and I wanted to, just, I just kind of hit the ground running with the record. I had this reserve of energy I was ready to put somewhere. And I, you know, and I think I sort of harnessed that disappointment and it helped the record, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Faster. Yeah, and yeah. were you, if you don't mind me asking, were you kind of like disappointed in the reunion just because it like wasn't fulfilling or because you wanted more? Um, I wanted it in a certain way. It's hard to get too specific. No, but, I, I understand. Um you know, it come, comes down to just personal differences, you know, personal creative differences about how it should happen um, and, and respectfully how it should happen. And, you know, I just think, yeah, it, we got off on the wrong foot and it wasn't, you know, we had one, I think we had one nice show in Montreal. That was a nice one. Um, oh yeah. I was, was about, I was there for that. I was there at, for okay. Pop Montreal and like last yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Pop Montreal is like one of my favorite festivals, so I'm a huge supporter of it. Me too. I am too. Um, yeah, that felt that was redemptive, but the support shows we did were just kind of, yeah, kind of just did more harm than good. I think. Under- but uh, yeah. Understood. Uh, but- onwards and upwards, though. I, I, I never liked. I never liked the idea of getting it back together and spending my time looking backwards on past accomplishments. I feel like I'm still alive. Absolutely. Still becoming so you can, a better writer. Yeah, know. yeah, absolutely. And you still are making fantastic albums with like tons of other bands and of course your solo efforts. So thank you. I just wanted to, t- I guess, talk more about the songs because they are like kind of this perfect mix. Um, the, like the lyrics are more like kind of internal musings and then the songs, like the actual songs themselves are like absolute bangers such as like the sample and i'm nobody leading into the hardcore bass and then it (laughs) and then it kind of samples uh the charles manson quote and then goes into the next song god internet and the songs kind of like represent at least to me they kind of hit me this way that this inner kind of reflection of our relationship kind of with the digital age and i was wondering if you talk about that a bit more and why you think that's a topic that so many people struggle with and also why it seems as if a lot of artists and bands have been kind of covering that topic in songs well i think if i could accurately describe it right now i wouldn't have written the song i think that's what maybe why i chose to um you know uh speak about it in song form that's kind of uh, for the most part is my preferred method of communication but I mean I'd be more curious to hear your you know interpretation of that song and like specifically how it relates to our relationship with the internet I, I do I don't know I don't think it's like the most profound subject matter but I think it's something that's just a daily constant part of our lives looking at screens interacting with people um abstractly through screens and 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 
it's just a weird time. I don't I don't know if it'll be like this forever. Will it evolve past the that thing? It already it already almost feels primitive, but it's got us all in such a grip that uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting. No, absolutely, and that's just what I kind of, that's how, what I saw it as, it was It was just that it's like, kind of this topic that we all struggle with, but it's so kind of in in our lives, no matter, like, there's no way to get it out of our life, so I feel like it's kind of like that big moral question as of any new technology or really anything that comes into society is like, how do we now deal with it and yeah. make, make it a normal part of our lives without right. it, like, <laughs> kind of destroying us? But right. so, so that's just yeah, how I kind of saw it. <laughs> what what yeah, I <laughs> sounds good to me. So, um, yeah. but you play in a lot of bands, including you know Islands, um, where you are the lead singer, and it's a lot of your own material. So, why is it important to you to kind of put out solo albums as Nick Diamonds? And what do you see as like kind of the differences amongst your solo work compared to your band work? I guess. Well, I just wanted to make. A record, I, and I didn't even have any intention of touring it or promoting it. Um, that just sort of happened once I, once I was like, oh, I want to release this. How should I release it? And I have a little label, so I decided to do it through that. But um, uh, you know, with with that, with, with that comes promotion, the whole machine of promotion, which I'm not at all a fan of. Uh, Most people aren't. Sort of had to, yeah, so I sort of had to play that game and that card and um yeah uh so that was that that was how that came about and you know i think it differs from islands in that yeah like i'm writing the songs with it with islands but gotcha um it's a but it's a group effort and and i like being you know having that ballast of of other musicians sort of centering the songs and straightening me out. Um, this was just a very personal little quick thing that I did um, just almost as an exercise, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I guess it's a good exercise to work your songwriting muscle. Yeah, keep it, keep it flexed and limber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I also mentioned earlier that, you know, you were involved with doing the uh, score for Serial, which was an absolutely, like, po- like it got extremely popular, like the podcast Serial. And I was wondering just, like, you know, how you got involved with that and how you created that music. Um, very similarly to how I did the City of Quartz record. In fact, that was also what spurred on the solo record was just having the tools, realizing I had the tools at home and also wanting to, to expand on those tools. And, and when I made the serial stuff, I didn't have much gear. I actually borrowed some recording equipment from my friend. Um, and when, uh, when I did, I was like, okay, I gotta get, I gotta invest in some actual gear. Cause if this is going to be what's happening and then the serial became kind of a big thing, I was like, Oh, I gotta, if I'm going to do more of this, I gotta get some proper gear. So that was also what spurred on the solo record was just getting some more good gear. Um, and yeah, it just kind of came about really naturally and quite fast. I just received an email from one of the show's producers, Julie Snyder, and she, she'd rec- been recommended, um, I'd come recommended by a fellow producer at This American Life who I happen to know in social settings. And I said yes, that I would do it because I was a fan of This American Life. And, you know, the next thing you know, it's out. And it was, it was, it was done very quickly. The music that I made was done very quickly. Yeah. And are you, like, personally interested in any, like, other podcasts or, like, involved in any other ones than, mm-hmm. obviously, than you mentioned? Uh, I, did a, I did some music for... Uh, another that's American Life affiliated uh, podcast called Mystery or the Mystery Show or something. Um, so I did that, and yeah, I don't want to be the podcast guy. That's not my <laughs> goal. Um, I like scoring stuff, but I'm much more. I much prefer writing my own songs um, and not having you know not being a client for hire because that's ultimately what it is. But it's it's a fun. It's also a fun exercise. 
Yeah, absolutely. You don't but, want people handing you the name tag that says podcast guy. But no, that's very yeah. cool. I think it's I always find it really amazing when artists are able to like add a score to other people's work as a, as well as like kind of create their own work. Um, yeah, it's a good it's a good muscle to be able to try to flex. I guess. Yeah, and then so out of all of this, then all of a sudden comes your film, That Dog. And I was just wondering what made you want to make a film and kind of what's the story behind it? And did you, you know, write and direct it? I did. I wrote and directed it. Um, it was just something I, uh, you know, I went to film school in Montreal and many years ago. And I decided after moving to L.A. and being in L.A. for two years, that um, that I would finally try to do what I long ago set out to do uh, and got distracted by the music thing. Um, and so, I'm, you know, I lived in L.A. and I was, I was surrounded by creative people all day making things and doing things. And, you know, they'd ask me to do a, a song for their thing or do a, design a little poster for this or that, and I realized that I didn't want to just be relegated to doing stuff on other people's work. I wanted to make my own thing. So I, I, I started, you know, I'd, I'd written stuff over the years, but I wrote something specifically that I figured would be easy enough to shoot. And I asked my friends to be in it. Um, and then I found some money for it. And that, that was kind of the, and then it was just happening and got made. You know, yeah, so. absolutely. I'm really interested in seeing it. Is it going to be, you know, like, is, are you looking to like release it other than, you know, I know it premiered at TIFF, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think the plan is to get it going on the 30th of this uh, month. So I think in a few days. And oh, awesome. It should be online. Very cool. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to checking out. Well, thank you so much for t- talking to me, Nick, and taking some time out. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Danny.